Welcome to A Day in the Life. My name is Thomas Galloway. Nadav Mayer is the owner of Morning Bell Coffee Roasters in Ames, Iowa. I've worked with Nadav on some projects in the past, but this was the first time we talked much about his background, how he operates his business, and other important things he's learned as an entrepreneur. Morning Bell is also in the process of expanding their coffee shop, and it was interesting to hear all the steps that are required in that process. If you enjoyed this interview, please subscribe and share with a friend. And if you're interested in law or politics, check out the Galloway Law Podcast as well. And now, to the interview. Before we get all into that, there's some exciting news with Morning Bell expanding. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we're uh, taking over the entirety of our building on Main Street, and we'll be building out um, our coffee shop part kind of in the front of the building in a more visible location. And what has been our location will now be just wholesale roasting, production, green coffee storage, and allow us to kind of expand the retail side and expand the wholesale side. Um, You know, so we're, we're growing at a good clip, and this was something we felt like we needed to do before too long in the right. you know, this was the time that we had to do it. That's good. So I read one of the Ames Tribune art- articles and they used the phrase like that you wanted to come in kind of modestly uh, yes. into Ames. Was that the case or was that just sort of how they phrased it or was was there actual intention? No, I think the Ames Tribune, uh, when they interviewed me, they didn't get you know, there's some stuff lost in translation as it went to a paper story. Right. But I definitely uh, talked to them about how I wanted to start modestly here. Right. You know, and that's g- generally a theme for entrepreneurship that I talk about quite a lot when I speak with folks that want to start their own businesses or that I mentor, counsel, consult with, whatever. So you finding ways to start small. Right. And for me, it's really important. You know, I, I want to be very conservative with my resources and my time. So that was the thought here when we started. I didn't know I was going to be in Ames, Iowa. You know, I had grossed in other places. There was, you know, maybe the fact that there were no businesses like mine here meant that Ames couldn't support a business like mine. Right. So you always have to keep that in mind. So yeah, I wanted to start as modestly as possible here. And that's why we started with a small space down the hall, you know, and with a very small roaster and really trying to start small. Right. So this move, Obviously, it's probably good for a lot of reasons, but you do lose a little bit of that mystery with the kind of the identity of that. Yes. Are you going to miss that at all, or does this this benefits of this new move completely, this expansion completely outweigh any of that? Yeah, I think for us, the the real push to do it was more the pain points, right. namely trying to roast huge wholesale orders every weekday right. in a quiet coffee shop environment. Yeah. So, and it just got to the point where that need of that industrial production vibe right. is coming head to head with the quiet, chill coffee shop vibe. Yeah. You know, it's like every seat is taken, and I would come back from lunch, hang out, you know, fire up the roaster, and, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and like everybody <laughs> clears out. Yeah. And it feels like that a lot, you know? It's, right. uh, it's not an isolated thing, and you know, I, I really feel the need to separate that. So that's one of the big pain points. And also, just having actual production space. Right. And with what we do in the small footprint that we have, you know, the 80 square feet or whatever of production space that we have in there is pretty amazing. Right. But it's not really sustainable based on our growth. So can we do it today? Yes. Is that, would we be able to do it exactly the same way two years from now? Maybe not. Right. So it's trying to alleviate some of the future pain. That's okay. it. But on the marketing side, I do think the hallway was really cool. I think people liked the hallway. And that definitely was an identity, but it was also a detractor for a lot of people. It's shady. You know, people would open the door, pee down that hallway. <laughs> I'm not going down there. Yeah. Like our current shop, uh, you know, is down this long hallway. It's well lit. There's art in it, but right. we're down this hallway, and that's kind of been part of the brand DNA. Yeah. For that modest beginning. So back to your career path. When was was there a time when you first thought about opening some kind of coffee shop or food service or anything like that? And then was there a point where like, you knew that that was something you could actually achieve? So I'd bring it back and um, I'd say in terms of my path that got me to where I started even with coffee. So first off, I really grew up in a small business family. Okay. And I think that that was a huge, uh, huge thing for me looking back on it. That a lot of young folks who don't have that experience are at a vast disadvantage right. to someone that grows up in that environment where business is modeled for you every day and you work in a family business growing up and see all the trials, tribulations, yeah. 
failure successes that go on and get, uh, you know, let all those experiences absorb into you mm -hmm. in a way. So, you know, I benefited from that and I always had this feeling that I was going to work for myself and I wanted to work for myself. So um, I got an MBA. You know, after I got my MBA, I went and worked corporate for a while. And that really solidified the fact that I did not want to work corporate, but that led to my first business selling battery backup systems and power supplies. Gotcha. And I did that for 12 years. In fact, I recently just closed it. Okay. So I was doing that alongside coffee for many right. years, selling batteries. Um, and that was great. And it was a great business. It made money. It didn't take up a lot of my time, but right. I was totally boring. Right. I was sitting, I would work at home, I'd have a couple calls and emails a day, selling batteries. And that was it. So I had time to do like, what else am I going to do? Right. And I'd be, you know, stuck at home for years. That led to, what else am I going to do? What other fun businesses can I get into? Right. That would be fun. So that's what led to coffee. Okay. So 2011 started roasting, and mainly I was on the wholesale side. So we did a farmers market once a week, and then I, my wholesale customers, that I would bring coffee to. We had some grocery stores. This was in Gainesville, Florida, 2011. Okay. And uh, that was how I started. Self-taught super modest and it was this feeling of like I'm gonna invest a thousand dollars if I can make it work for a thousand dollars awesome if not awesome right so that's how it started okay and then we sold the business a year and a half after we started and that was a huge win for us and I didn't really know if I was gonna stay in the coffee business or not at that point but then I couldn't get away from it we moved right. to Phoenix and I was just completely hooked missed it after we sold it and that's what led to me continuing to do it and eventually here in Ames having my first coffee shop so before that I was always just wholesale we had a very small tasting room in Phoenix so that was kind of a borderline vibe you know it wasn't a full coffee service but you could come in a few hours a day see me right. buy a bag of coffee bottle of cold brew very modest but really the vibe was farmers markets okay and wholesale how did you like Gainesville we loved Gainesville my okay. wife grew up in Gainesville okay um, so Gainesville uh, is a special place in our heart for sure. Right. My in-laws still live in Gainesville, okay. so we get there every so often. And that's a great time. Right. I was. I've been considering the University of Florida, but I haven't been to Gainesville. So you I was. You know, my in-laws when they come visit Ames, they say that Ames is like Gainesville was in the eighties. Okay. So it's like uh, Gainesville is kind of like Ames on steroids, right. but in the south. So. You know, it's a big town. There's a lot going on, and I think it's a population of 100,000 with maybe right. 70,000 students because there's two colleges there. Okay, yeah. Um, so, and there's tons of um, hubs of entrepreneurship and innovation, right. you know, business incubators, and it's a very big startup scene for tech and other industries in right. Gainesville. Right. Very lively place. Okay. A lot going on. Yeah, you should go visit. That's good to know, yeah. yeah. So then, between the time you sold that and started again in Phoenix, how much time was there? That was about six months. Six months, okay, so pretty quick. And in Phoenix, did, so that would have been about 2013? Yeah, it was 20, yeah, I think we started in May 2014. And it took, because it took some time to buy a roaster, find a place, right. build out a place, get all the permits. So I think, yeah, if I remember correctly, we sold the business in April, May 2013, and by May 2014, we were open again in downtown Phoenix. Okay. Does the weather hurt coffee in Phoenix at all, or is it just such, is it such a niche group that's so into coffee that it doesn't matter? Phoenix is a totally hot coffee scene. Okay. And it's gotten more intense since we left. Gotcha. Um, I think when we left, there were 40 roasters, and there are more now. Tons of coffee shops, tons of independent shops, um, really good specialty scene. Um, you know, the weather was an issue some of the time, but I would sell hot coffee, Chemex, we make Chemex on site at the farmer's market, 120 degrees. Interesting. Yeah, wow. we sell hot coffee. Right. And we would also sell a lot of cold brew, and that's where we really got focused and started working on our cold brew stuff and yeah. uh, cut our teeth on it in Phoenix. And okay. that's why people like our cold brew, I think, because I worked really hard yeah, on it. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of effort put into making cold brew. Okay. But yeah, there's definitely hot coffee going on. <laughs> right, right. All the time. Interesting. Okay. And then, and then the move was to here? Yep. In 2015? 2015. 15? Yeah. Okay. It took us, uh, it about a year. I was roasting in my garage. Okay. Shipping weekly to all my customers, wholesale and retail, back in Phoenix. Gotcha. For that time. And that was really kind of both sketchy, crazy. And I would roast at night after the sun was down. And, you know, it was not, right. it was not the perfect situation. Right. But I, you know, it was good. It kept me roasting, kept my head in the game until we got this building, built this out. Right. And that took a while. Okay. 
And when did some of the like wholesale, like through High V and Wheatsfield, when did that sort of start up pretty quick, or did that take so, some time? I try to do a lot of things. This is one of these marketing, you know, as I think about starting a business, wanting to start a business, and how you position yourself for marketing. Right. And really, having marketing be a, a big part of how you think about what the brand DNA is. Right. So for me, it was really important that I not do any outside sales. Mm -hmm. Just for my own, I really am a firm believer in if you create a good product and position it the right way, right. and uh, word will get around, yep. you want to create the buzz, you want to create the word of mouth as much as possible and encourage that to happen. Right. And try not to stymie that in any way because it's, a, it's the push versus pull to sales vibe. Yep. So I try to pull and not push. That's right. much more my vibe. And I've been in sales for many, many years. You know, long before I was in coffee. So all that positioning kind of came second nature to me. So I would say we're well positioned here for pull, not push. Right. And then that extends to wholesale. So my goal is always to have enough capacity for the next wholesale customer okay. that I know is out there. So the folks who get in touch with us or come to the shop and are interested in buying from us, I give them lots of attention, right? I love them all. I'm so excited to see them and I have the capacity to sell to them. Right, yep. As opposed to, you know, there's a be real easy for me to grow too quick, right? If I went out and got outside sales folks, yeah. it could be a big problem because in this business, if you grow too quick, I gotta get a bigger roaster, I'm gonna have to have a bigger right. building. You know, you're, this is a very capital intensive business yeah. that the, the, you know, it's really hard to manage the, the growth curve on this kind of business in terms of growing. Um, and it's always the joke of coffee roasting that uh, it's like, great, you're doing good, now you need to do the roaster. You know? right. It's like, right. whatever success you have, you know, there's yeah, going to be uh, a kick on the other yeah. side. And, you know, it's a similar feeling with building this out. It's like, oh, great, you're doing so well. So many people are coming in every day and having a nice coffee. Well, great, now you can't do that in that same space anymore. <laughs> Pay up so you can get to yeah. you know, get into the next space. So I think that having the, the ability to, to do that is good encourage ways that you can pull and start right. push. So you talked about the influence of having a family of small business entrepreneurs and I was wondering how much did your education and through undergrad and MBA, how much did that contribute to understanding how to run a small business? It's a great question. I think technically there were things that I learned in the MBA, clearly, but it was very clear to me after the MBA and now that the MBA is a professional degree to train folks to work in corporate life. Right. It's not that relevant to small business operation. Okay. Um, you know, it's, I put it in the same category as a lot of other professional degrees that would help you move up a ladder in a large organization where they're looking to hit those check marks. Right. So if you work corporate for a few years after graduating and you say, hey, I love this, I'm in this, this is going to be good for me, you should get your MBA because you're right. going to be in there. Yeah. Whereas for me, it wasn't quite the perfect fit because I knew I was going to work for myself. Right. And, you know, I did it, but it wasn't, uh, I, don't, I always say that I learned much more from my parents than I did from my MBA. Right. You know, the MBA is really an overview. You know, if you look at what the course schedule is, you know, you get all those silos. So you get some HR, you get yep. some finance, you get some marketing, um, you know, you get accounting. So you get some broad overview of a whole operation in the corporate sense. So, you know, it's not that they're going to teach you how to, even though I added some small business classes, they were very rudimentary, you know, they're, they're not going to do much more than, you know, a lot of the undergraduate business classes where you're going to come up with a business plan and pitch an idea and, you know, try to think of the pitfalls and, right, and then right, uh, yeah. perform a statements of what you expect sales and, you know, to be. Um, but I would only recommend the MBA if your heart is set on corporate and you've had corporate experience okay. to say, yes, this is for me. Um, like one of the things for me, I hate sitting. Like me and you are sitting right now. It's pretty rare. You know, I'm only sitting because I've been in planes and cars so much the last few days. Yeah. Normally, I only stand. Right. I only like to stand. Like uh, you know, and that's one of the things that just brings you crazy. Any place you've had a you know a roastery or the coffee shop, there's no chairs for employees, including me. Right. Yeah. You know, I just it's, I like to lay it's down and stuff like that. But if I remember working corporate where it's like Not you're stopped. made to sit. It's, it's you know. It's yeah. a thing, so it's, it's things like that, that uh, being able to control your own environment, that's a biggie for having small business, and I like that feeling too. Right. It's much more comfortable for me. Is it very common to have like groups of small business entrepreneurs that, that they can meet together in different places you've gone? Have you seen a whole lot of those? Like, You know, there's Chamber of Commerce, it's kind of okay, a yeah. classic example. Yeah. Um, 
that they get together. You know, I think local chambers like the one we have in Ames here, they really do good work locally. Um, the networking, there's a couple of reasons that stops that networking. But I think one of the things that happens is the general type of a small business person is that they're going to be holding their cards close right. in every possible way. They're going to be very wary of competitors that they might interact with locally, because that's kind of this traditional view of business where your competitor is your enemy. So, yeah. um, so I feel like a lot of the small business networking tends to not get to a very deep level. With that said, what's going on in Ames is amazing. It's where I network, you know, a lot of my customers are small business owners, right. but also there's other folks, like new folks coming into town, like Mindy from Cook Support, you know, this young family that they bought at Cook Support and have taken over and are doing amazing things. Yeah. She's awesome. Like, yeah. You can just feel she has so much passion for it. And like, there's gonna be people like that to network with that are not, you know, not in competition, but right. here we have this amazing Main Street vibe too, where everybody kind of works together, it seems, to try to make that good. So, I feel like there's more, there's room for that, clearly. Right. But there are also some significant barriers, historically and structurally, that people yeah. from being, you know, it's not necessarily your crew that you're going to go out with all these other small business people. Right. Or, you know, you always got to be wary, oh yeah, here's my crew, here's the dude that sells me insurance, right? And here's the, you know, it's like it's really easy to find friends who uh, just want to sell you things, right. too, that's out there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, so, what is, how do the relationship form with, like, your coffee bean suppliers? How does some of the relationship form? Do you have, how often do they change? Do you have a lot of them? Just the whole process. It's a crazy process. It's actually one of the most opaque parts of the coffee business. And I always joke I'm, that, you know, I'm still wrapping my head around it, but there's huge learning curves. And that's one of the things that's fun in coffee in general. It's very humbling. Right. It's not a business where you're like, I got this. Yeah. Like, and then you just keep making the same whatever it is without a lot of innovation. Here's a business that's really constantly changing. You know, especially coffee is, is crazy. Right. So the supply chain for good coffees is very opaque. Right. Um, I've done a, cut my teeth on a lot of things to get to the point where we're able to buy the coffees that we want. Um, I'd say the biggie was trusting our palate. You know, I'm right. really working it for years on tasting coffee right. and sample roasting and evaluating samples from lots of different suppliers. Um, you know, a lot of coffee roasters, the trend I'd say in the business is that they work directly with one large importer. Okay. Because they might be able to arrange slightly more favorable pricing or by location, it's convenient that they're going to be nearby, or they have a relationship with one particular trader. I take the other approach. I try to source purely on the merits of the coffee okay. and try to work with as wide a range of people, of people as possible. Right. So we work with a ton of different suppliers. I always joke that I've probably sampled roasted coffee from every larger importer, you know, and reached out to them right. because you know I, I want to try to be quality focused and and get it. And it's it's kind of crazy because it's so personal, right? It's like the coffees that I buy are tuned to my palate yeah. and and tuned to the palate of the barista team that I work with and my assistant manager Emily. And right. you know, we want to work really hard to buy coffees that we love. Right. That speak to us, and we're really picky. So we might sample those 30, 40 coffees before we pick one. Right. And that's so rare. And I, you know, when I'm at events in the industry, and I'll see, you know, there'll be parties where you'll be drinking, and they'll bring out some samples of coffee, and some dudes will contract and buy like large volumes of coffee, right. like a year's worth of whatever. You know, just because their buddy brought it to them, it's that relationship. They're only going to choose between two. They're going to taste it at that moment, and it's done. Right. And that's wild. Like for me, every time I see that, I'm like, I, you know, do that anyway. it's crazy. Yeah. Um, but there are some coffees that I buy year after year. You know, where we have direct trade relationships. I have some coffees with traders that they bring in the same coffees year after year. Okay. They're really strong coffees for them. Right. And relationship coffees, and I love those coffees. So we have some coffees like that. Um, but it kind of runs the game. And then we have a lot that we buy that we never see again. Right. Um, but it's a really wild market to try to play in, and the supply of some of those coffees can be very variable. But the way I think about it from a marketing sense is when you come in and you buy a bag of coffee here, you're at the end of the day, if you choose to keep buying coffee from us and the coffees change, what you're buying into is our vision for coffee and right. our palette for choosing coffee. So right. it's kind of what's on the wall at that moment should be irrelevant. It's more like you know this is a place that has coffee that I like. Right. And I feel like coffee in general is so should be like that. You know, if like someone as a consumer finds a roaster that they like, whether it's 
where they live or otherwise. Of course, we want people to buy local, but you know, the coffee market is huge. There's a lot of different roasters, and they each have their own vision. You know, yeah, whether yeah, it, exactly. to what level it is, but if you want to, if you find roasters you connect with, that's good. Right. You know, it's like that's that's can, not necessarily a normal thing. They can trust the source of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's similar to like if there's a podcaster that I really am into, anything that person recommends, I'm like, okay, it must be good. I'm gonna try it out. Yeah, you gotta listen. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and part of that is uh, following your heart in that way. And I, you know, and of course, as a small business, I wanted to do what I could do to encourage those connections and right. encourage that affinity to what I do. Yeah. You know, in all sorts of subtle ways. And I think that's important to think about too, is removing barriers. Um, yeah, just in general terms of when you think about setting up a business, make it easy for your customers. Make right. them want to come back. Figure out the, the bottlenecks and the barriers and the reasons why other businesses like that have failed. Right. You know, so you can ease those bottlenecks for your customers. Um, especially coffee is not known as friendly, warm, and welcoming. Right. Not known. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times I visit shops, other places in the country, as I did this past weekend, pretty amazed by how not warm, cold, and you know, pretentious, it can, even if it's not pretentious, just not being warm. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but the pretension is another thing. Yeah, there's, right. there can be that too. Right. But, you know, when, I, when people come into my shop, I want it to be love fest. Yeah. You know, I want people to be like, what is happening here? Right. Where, you know, what is going on? Why does this place feel so good to be in? Right. And that's easy to do, right? That has nothing to do with anything, any of the products that I sell. Yeah. It has nothing to do with anything else. It could, you know, it could be a cardboard shack on the side of the road. Right. But if people feel good to come in, you know, those are the kind of things that you can do in business that are, make the product irrelevant. Right, yeah. So exactly. I would keep, that eye, keep your eye on the prize of knowing what your customers need. Right, yeah. Okay, so was there a, what was, say, the most satisfying moment of starting a coffee shop or the whole process of wholesale was there a moment of like, great satisfaction like I there's something I'm really happy that happened is there a particular moment that stands out to you you know I'd say realizing that the the most important thing for me personally about the business is the social vibe and right. the connection with my customers here and with my employees for me that has been the winner Right. And that's why I you know I'm, I'm a lifer in this business. Right. It's just such a good feeling. I love to be able to connect with folks like you. Yeah. If yeah. I meet you on the street or wherever, right? right. It's pretty yeah. awkward if I run into you in Highview and be like, dude, let's talk about whatever. And yeah. Like, Who's this guy? Right? right? So right. context is very important in life. Yeah. So having that social vibe here, and this is coming from a guy that I worked at home for right. years. You know, I'd be like stuck at home. And you know, I'm a, learning that I'm a social person by nature. Right. And it really started with doing that farmer's market once a week where it'd be this intense social thing for four hours. Yeah. To get to the point where it's like, I can do that every day. Right, right. And it's fun. So yeah. that's, that's the best part for me. Okay. You know, all the rest of it is, you know, I'm glad we're doing well. You know, right. I'm glad people, every day people come in and buy coffee. I'm like, thank God. <laughs> you know, we're doing good. We can keep doing right. this. You know, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. But I, uh, I don't really have any anxiety about the financial parts of it. You know, this kind of business is very steady. Yeah. You know, it's not, uh, we don't have the radical swings, seasonal swings. I mean, it's a very steady kind of business, which is interesting. And uh, yeah, that's the winner for me, okay. the social part. That's cool, that's cool. Okay, so as far as just a general daily routine, what is typically, what typical time do you normally get up? So I can tell you about my ideal daily routine, okay. and then I'll tell you about the reality at different right. points, you know, as we're coming into this time of, needing to build the space out, right. um, I'll tell you that uh, building a business like this, right? So we're like, I want to have a coffee shop. Let's go talk to the city and the state and see what I need to do to make right. that happen. That's maybe the worst process ever. You know, to the point where once you're done taking out loans and building it and all the stuff, you'll be like, you're just ready to cry and go home and right. cry and not open the day that it's done. Seriously, it's horrible, like soul-crushing experience. So I've heard, yeah. So I am at the forefront of doing that again here, right? As we sit in this room, this is gonna be the future coffee shop. So I'm at the start of that process. So I know my near future, there's not a lot of ideal days are gonna be happening. Uh, but generally, my kids wake me up at seven or earlier. Okay. So at this point, the kids are six and three, okay. so all in Zulby. Um, so they wake me up, and we gotta get them out the door to daycare, to school. Okay. Um, and then either f my wife helps me to do it, I can get out and go for a run before I come into work, um, but uh, 
If I can get a run in the morning, then I'll come in, hang out for a few hours, we might test some of the sample roast that we did the day before, um, evaluate some coffees, see what kind of what we need to do for the day. Generally, I try not to roast in the morning. Okay. We're fairly busy in the mornings, and you know, I'll hang out for a little while, and usually if I haven't run, I'll leave at 10 or 11, go home, go for a run, right. make lunch at home, you know, do any other errands that I need to do, you know, because my wife is a professor, so that's right, why we moved right. to Ames for her job. So, you know, in this uh, egalitarian lifestyle, right, it's very not traditional in the way that I was brought up in my family, and I think for a lot of men in my age, and I was born in the late 70s, it's been, the world is a different place. Couples are different than they right. were when I was growing up. So the, there's a lot that I need to do to, to help with household stuff. Right. So that's a big part of my work there too, because we have young kids, so that can't necessarily happen in the evening. Right. So work has to happen during working hours, and then other things have to happen during those hours too. <laughs> so, you know, it's pretty crazy life, but I know I'm very productive. I know in the hours that I have during the working day, we get a huge amount done. Right. Um, but I do work at night sometimes. That's also a thing. But yeah, I'll go for a run, I'll have lunch, and then I'll come back and roast, right. usually most weekday afternoons. Um, I'll be roasting this afternoon. You know, today we're also going to be getting in a shipment of about a ton and a half of green coffee. Wow. So that's always dicey. Of like, when does the truck come, and who's going to help me, and right. we're going to stack those bags up, which is really tough in our little space. Yeah. So, and in a day today, like when it's raining, it's really hard to accept green coffee. So, you know, like every day there could be fun surprises like that too. Right. But then it's the mad dash after I close up the shop uh, to get the kid or both kids and get home, make dinner, bath time, kids in bed. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a crazy life for the young kids. So we have not just this project going on, but we also are in the process of buying a house downtown. Okay. And moving downtown to Northern. Right, That's so a lot of stuff happening. So that is also a project that's going to be happening at the same time as this right. project. We have a bunch of work to do over there before we can move right. and try to sell the house right now. Yeah. So it's the time of maximum, maximum right. chaos. If you make it to the next few months. Yeah, but I feel spring is going to be good. Right, right. You know, but uh, one of the things that happened to us is uh, we had our second kid was in the NICU. Okay. When he was born, and he had this rare disease, and it was a really crazy time in our lives. And like my wife came home twice over the course of thirty days for a meal, really? for like a shower. It was really, really crazy, and all this anxiety about our son. And he's doing great now. We passed right. that period. Okay, good. Um, and then after he got out of the hospital, we moved here like a week later. Really? And Darcy got a new job, and you know, all this stuff happened exactly at the same time. That was maximum chaos. All the rest of this is under control. It's like if nothing happens today, okay. You know, it's like this is all easy compared to that time. Yeah. I look back on that, that was like right. madness. Right. So everything's relative, you know? Yeah. Like, there is gonna be a lot of fun stuff going on in the next few months here. Right. So as far as talking about the roasting in the afternoon, that'll be able to change once you have it expanded, or are you still probably going to stick to a similar schedule? I think it's going to be a similar schedule. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. I think uh, a couple things with roasting, there's some startup and cool down times. Right. So it's not like you can just, you know, immediately be productive with it right away. So once you turn it on, you want to be able to do it for a little while. Right. So, you know, you got to fit that into your lifestyle. You know? Yeah. And I think that's another good thing to think about businesses. You know, you want to find a business that suits your life. Right. And sometimes you have to experiment with that. You know, it's like if you want to have a trucking company, could be a really good business, could be a great business, but, you know, right, right. does that fit into your life? Yeah. And, you know, you're going to want to yeah. try to find people who are truckers. And right. Them. And, you know, it's like, who knows what kind of chaos in that business. But, right. you know, I think that's really important is, uh, is to be able to taste the business you dream about. You know, and I didn't do this in the case of coffee. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, it's a good move to be like, hey, if you buy coffee, you should go work at a coffee shop. Right. You should go work at a roastery. And, you know, it's famously hard to work at a roastery. Okay, yeah. It takes years usually for people to get in their foot in the door where right. all they're allowed to do is sweep the floor <laughs> for like a year. You know, for a lot of roasters, like that's the story of how they get into it. Right. And then they have to wait until the roaster quits, dies, or is sick, <laughs> that they're allowed to ever touch the roaster. You know, and it's, it's usually like that in a lot of places, so. Um, but I do recommend, you know, taste it. You know, it's really right. easy when you're, you know, undergraduate age, or just after undergraduate age, you can move and do these things. There's more flexibility in your life, even though right. it doesn't feel like it. There's much more flexibility than you'll have 10 years from now. 
So it's really good to be able to be like, I'm interested in uh, you know manufacturing. And I think it's cool. Maybe that would be good for me and line up with what I want to do. Like you should go taste it. Right. See what the vibe is. See if you click with the people. I think that's uh, that really can make it or break it for a lot of folks. Gosh, yeah. So how is your basically what you've done in your job changed from when you first started to now as you've expanded, as you've grown? Uh, what is your typical duties? Like how has it transformed? It's a good question. I think uh, the duties are basically the same. You know, with this type of business, there there's more of them sometimes, right. but the goal is to kind of keep it simple. And I would say that's another big message for business. Keep it simple. Right. You know, if you're gonna like we have this example in uh, the province area in Boston, or you know, we're Israeli. I lived in Israel many years, okay. and in Boston there's a lot of Israelis. And there was a guy that his thing is he wanted to bring an Israeli pizza making bakery to Boston. Gotcha. And just make pizza bread. Right. P I T A. So you know, there's Israeli pizza. The pizza bread is very specific. It's very soft. It's very different than a lot of other pizza that you find, and it doesn't really exist in the U.S. So everybody's like, maybe it'll be good, maybe not. You know, we don't really know how, how it's going to go. How to bring people. And he's wildly successful. Apparently, he's like, right. has to move this, this baking. Like, he has to get an industrial sized facility now <laughs> to keep up with that much pizza bread. But all the machinery is brought in from Israel. Right. So you yeah, know, there's some of that to it too. That uh, right. you got to keep it simple. You know, if you can focus on one product and not, you know, like for example, in the coffee shop, I don't do food. Right. You know, for a lot of restaurants and coffee shops, they they sell a lot of food and they want to figure out how to sell more coffee. Right. You know, we're focused super on coffee. Yeah. And that works for us in many different ways. So I think being able to keep it simple and and maintain that vision throughout because it's real easy to add more things. Right. There's always the possibility to get into more stuff. And we resist that urge heavily. Right. Uh, but that's just kind of born of my experience with it and being, you know, with business and being able to say, no, that's not for us, thanks, right. and move on. Whereas for other folks, you know, it's being able to, as a small business owner, people are bringing you opportunities all the time. Right. And the hardest thing for a small business owner is to decide which opportunities are worthwhile and which are not. Right. So that's a biggie. That's experience is needed for that often. I believe that, yeah. Well, I'm really glad we did this. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. It's a Appreciate pleasure. It. Yeah. Uh, let me know what else I can do. I'm and sure. It's always fun to talk about these things. And I'd say if there's any listeners out there to your podcast, uh, you definitely can contact me. I always like to talk about business and sure. um, try to help people uh, dream about their businesses. And I think it's a worthwhile journey. I think the world of work, you know, for a lot of folks, you know, you graduate college, the world of work doesn't necessarily sound like a lot of fun. Right. You know, it sounds like something that we kind of have to do to live, right? And, right, right, right? and there's the whole work to live, live to work thing. And I think that it's possible to love what you do. Right. And I didn't grow up thinking that. And now yeah. loving what I do, I know that it's possible. And I think everybody should get to that place if they can. Right. And uh, so it's possible. It's possible to love what you do. Go get them. If you need help to try to find it, contact me. All right, very good. That's a great yeah. time, Don. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, Tom. Yeah.